Hello, this is HG Tudor, and this is part two of Ask HG Tudor. Our first question comes from Storm, who is in Yorkshire in the United Kingdom. She writes, Hi, HG. So my question is that I am the primary chosen intimate partner. So if I'm such a great source of fuel, and you feed off that positive fuel in the golden period, why feel the need to turn it into negative fuel if you are surrounded by other negative fuel sources? The fact is that we have fuel networks. The size of those depends on the type of narcissist. We will almost always have a primary source. Most of the time, this person is an intimate primary source. Occasionally, if, for example, it is a member of the family, they are non-intimate. We will then have a range of secondary sources. Many of these will be non-intimate secondary sources, colleagues, friends, family members. But there will also be intimate partner secondary sources, people that we are having an affair with, somebody who we use for a booty call, somebody we have as a friends with benefits, and then there are the tertiary sources. We derive both positive and negative fuel from all of these sources. Most of the time, tertiary sources provide us with positive fuel, occasionally negative. For example, we decide to lash out at the valet for being slow about bringing our car back. So uh, they react in a hurt or angry manner at what we say to them. Most secondary sources enjoy elongated golden periods because we do not uh, place a demand on their fuel too often. So we do not become bored of it or find it stale. And thus, because these people tend to be an important part of the facade, they are members of the coterie, our lieutenants are drawn from them, we derive positive fuel from them more often than not. Occasionally, if they let us down, we may decide that we will devalue them, gain some negative fuel, and then discard them. Sometimes we may just, may just decide to discard a secondary force because it is easy enough to replace them. The situation is somewhat different with the primary source. The primary source, by which with the very name, is the person from whom we gain the most fuel most frequently and is the most potent variety. This means that the intimate partner primary source, or in rare instances, the non-intimate primary source, is hugely important to us. Accordingly, once your positive fuel does not satisfy us anymore, either its potency is reduced or you're not providing it frequently enough or in the appropriate uh, quantities, then you have let us down. This means that we switch to negative fuel. There are two reasons for this. The first is we cannot just go and find an immediate primary source and gain positive fuel from them, because if we did that, there would be a cessation. If we decided after your positive fuel is not enough, we immediately discarded you and there was no devaluation, we would then have to spend time finding a new primary source, seducing them and embedding them. That would leave us with a fuel deficiency. Secondly, you have to be punished because you have let us down. Therefore, it is not a case of we feel the need to turn it into negative fuel, but rather it has to happen. It is instinctive. It is a consequence of the fact that you have let us down. Therefore, in order to keep up our fuel needs, we switch to negative fuel to punish you, but also to ensure that we gain a new type of fuel that is potent, frequent and in the right quantities. And of course, the contrast between the positive and the negative makes it all the more satisfying. At the same time, whilst this devaluation is ongoing, we begin the search for the new primary source in order to find there the new uh, potent and fulsome source of primary positive fuel. It is not the case that we are ordinarily surrounded by other negative fuel sources. Indeed, we prefer to draw positive from tertiary and most certainly from secondary. And negative fuel is mostly only ever obtained from the primary source. This is also the case because we want to maintain the facade. So behind closed doors, we treat you horribly. You give us the strong negative fuel. Everybody else we treat well. 
They provide us with positive fuel, but they also then cannot believe your protestations that we treat you so badly. And as a consequence, this is why negative fuel is almost always ever drawn in such huge amounts from the primary source. The next question comes from Maple Bucket from the United States. Maple Bucket asks, is a lesser and mid-range narcissist called this because they don't know what they are? If they do research like you did, can they become a greater narcissist once they understand their self? The lesser is called a lesser because of their lesser cognitive function. Similarly, the mid-range is called that because of their mid-range cognitive function. And it is correct, they do not know what they are. They have no awareness, nor will they ever gain it. If they were ever minded to do some research, their inherent self-defence mechanisms mean they cannot recognise the behaviours that are described to them as narcissistic as being applicable to them. It is a simple case of they will react in a manner of saying, it does not compute, it does not compute. Thus, for example, if you were to point out to a lesser that they are, that that person is a narcissist, all they will hear you doing is criticising them. That ignites their fury, self-defence mechanisms kick in, so they react in a fashion which causes them to lash out at you, which causes them to gain fuel to address the wound that you have caused, and allows them to gain the upper hand once again in terms of control and the relationship. Similarly, with the mid-range, if you were to say to that person you are a narcissist, they may see that some of their behaviours could accord with that, but their lack of awareness and their inherent need to gain fuel to remain in control and superior to you means that they automatically and instinctively reject such assertions. And therefore, they will engage in certain manipulations to draw fuel from you and, by the same token, assert control again. If you listen to the recordings, know you are the narcissist parts one and two, and that explains the situation whereby you suggest to an individual, be they a lesser or a mid-ranger, that they are a narcissist. Accordingly, they would not do any research, and even if you put it in front of them, the way that they have been created with their lack of insight and lower cognitive function means that they just cannot accept what is being said and that their automatic self-defence mechanisms will reject the assertions that are being made. A lesser cannot become mid-range, a mid-range cannot become greater, and so on and so forth. The schools of narcissism are set from the outset of the creation of the narcissist. The next question is from Common Sense from Montego Bay in Jamaica. How important is the actual pleasure derived from good sex to a somatic narcissist? In terms of the actual pleasure, it depends whether you're referring to the actual pleasure coming from the victim or that is being experienced by the narcissist. In terms of the pleasure that is being experienced by the victim, this is fundamentally important because this is fuel. The noises of delight, the expressions of desire, the widening of the eyes, the oohs, the ahs, the smiles, the panting, the screams, all of that is excellent fuel, which is hugely important to the somatic narcissist. It also provides evidence of binding, because sex is a weapon of mass seduction. How important then is the pleasure derived from good sex? for the somatic narcissist him or herself. In terms of physical pleasure, naturally, because our kind are made of flesh and blood, we feel the similar sensation of bodies rubbing together, mouth sucking, hand stroking, and so on and so forth. And therefore the nerve endings experience the pleasure in a similar way. It provides a pleasant feeling, which may well lead to orgasm. So the physical sensations are there. But what sex is really about is the reaction of the person we are having sex with, the fuel. And because somatic narcissists 
employee bodies are focused on uh, physical attraction, the way that people look, being fit, being healthy, engaging in a lot of sex, then the response of the victim is the most important item because it is fuel. It evidences the level of control the somatic narcissist has over his or her victim. The somatic narcissist recognises that using sex is a highly effective method of binding the individual to them, of gaining fuel on a repeated basis and ensuring that the act of sex, which somatic and elite narcissists are exceptionally good at, causes the victim to become addicted to that. So often people write that they may hate and despise their narcissist, but the sex was out of this world. So as a consequence, the fuel that is gained is very important. The ability to, to bind is very important. And the pleasure that is derived by the narcissist is in essence the physical sensations, but ultimately it is all about the sense of power that arises from the receipt of fuel. The next question is from Lou, who is in Sydney, Australia. She writes, following my recent return from leaving for several months, my great narcissist has started looking for other appliances for the first time in our five years together. He obtained some in my absence. He is adamant that he wants me, but he wants others also. The issue for me is he insists I can do the same. My question is, when he says I can have other men, does he mean it? Or is it a test? And what is the likely outcome if I do? In this instance, Lou, one has to examine the dynamic that you ha have with your particular narcissist. It appears that you have escaped him. And as a consequence, he has engaged with other appliances. He may well have made one of those his intimate partner primary source, or he may have decided to have a range of intimate partner secondary sources, something which a greater narcissist is quite capable of doing, as he ascertains which one should be installed as his new primary source. A number of months have gone by, and therefore I suspect that he has put a primary source in place. With regard to yourself, your escape meant that you were removed from the position of primary source and you would have become then a non-intimate secondary source. He has remained in contact with you. He states he's adamant that he wants you, but is being upfront about the fact that he wants others as well. That is something that a greater would quite readily admit. When he is saying that you can have other men, what he is doing is attempting to lure you into a false sense of security and he is testing you. He is entitled to do as he pleases. He can have as many appliances as he wants, of an intimate, intimate variety. He has this sense of entitlement and no sense of accountability. He can go where he wants, do what he wants, whenever and with whomsoever. The position is different for you. You belong to him, and only to him. And therefore, when he is telling you that you can have other men, he is waiting to see what you will do. He is doing it as a test. He wants to see if you will refuse that request, and that you will beg for him, and that you will want to come back to him, and that you will engage in an intimate relationship with him, so that you become an intimate partner secondary source. He will then consider whether he wishes to promote you to return to being the intimate partner primary source or whether he will keep you as an intimate partner secondary source so that he can keep dipping in and out of your fuel as and when he chooses. If you were to choose other men, he would regard this as a criticism. Given that he is a greater, he may well be able to control his ignited fury. But understand this, 
He would be looking to derail the new relationships that you enter into. He may even, at first, suggest that you have his blessing and he hopes that you're happy. But he will throw this in your face at a later stage. And no matter how you say to him that he encouraged it, he will deny this or suggest that at the time he was upset and did not know what he was saying or that you ought to have known better and that if you really did love him, you would not have done this. So he is setting you up for a fall. He is testing you. He wants to see if you will do it or whether, as he hopes, you will refuse and come running to him, begging to resurrect the relationship with him. If you go ahead with it, he is likely to keep his fury under control. But understand me, he will throw this back in your face at a later stage by using it against you, by calling you a slut, a slag, that you are promiscuous, that you didn't care for him, and so on and so forth. The next question is from Maria from Romania, who asks, what is the best way to escape in a friendly fashion a narcissistic relationship? And Maria explains that she would not like to stir anger, anger or provoke a reaction. Generally speaking, if you decide that you wish to escape a narcissistic relationship, you are going to cause fury. I assume you're referring to a romantic relationship whereby you are entangled with a narcissist whereby you are that narcissist intimate partner. If you decide to escape, you are cutting off our fuel. This is a huge criticism to us. This means that our fury is ignited and we will lash out at you. We will try and stop you leaving. And if you listen to the videos concerning how no contact feels, part one, two and three, you will understand there the immediate response of a narcissist, be he lesser, mid-range mid or greater, to the situation whereby you have explained that you are leaving or you just suddenly leave. The reaction is not a good one. This is because you are fighting against our control. You are undermining our sense of superiority. You are not doing what we want. If you want to try and leave in a friendly fashion, you cannot do so. You may be able to achieve this if you are discarded. In such a circumstance, of course, the narcissist is no longer interested in you and instead is focused on the new primary source. This means that you can be left alone for a period of time and thereafter you can put in place no contact to avoid the narcissist coming near you again. If this does happen, you can perhaps, if you feel strong enough and able to do so, engage with the narcissist in a friendly manner so that you provide positive fuel, but you refrain from entering into the former relationship again. Of course, by providing fuel, you will keep giving the narcissist hope that he can pull you back into the former relationship. Therefore, you will face repeated hoovers, which may turn malign if he realises that you will not enter into the formal relationship. The simple fact is, if you are trying to get away from us, you are throwing off the yoke of our control, removing the chains and criticising us. This means we will try and stop you. This means invariably that our fury will be ignited, and therefore you will always provoke a reaction. The next question is from Carmen in New Hampshire in the United States of America. Hello, HG. Is it possible that hoovering comes in the form of sudden multiple Facebook requests? I have blocked my ex on Facebook and other areas. Lately, I have taken those requests and had brief conversations, only to notice that it's always the same questions and mode of writing style. Yes, Carmen, it is indeed a form of hoovering. It is usually the case, of course, that when you go no contact, that the most effective way of doing so is to come off all social media. Of course, some people will not do this. They do not want their lives to be affected by the narcissist in such a way that they feel that they cannot engage in social media any longer. Therefore, they will look to block and ensure 
that the narcissist does not see what they are posting. Of course, social media is, as I have explained on many occasions, a great tool for us. And therefore, one way of getting around you blocking is for us to create false profiles and then send you friend requests and such like. Accordingly, these are a form of hoover. And the fact that you have noticed that it is always the same questions and mode of writing style means that it is either your narcissist with fake profiles or potentially lieutenants acting on his behalf. So as a consequence, whenever you have got no contact with a narcissist and you have blocked them, you should never accept any approaches, friend requests, messages, etc. from somebody who is not known to you. And if the individual, if the individual is known to you, you should think carefully about what information you provide in case it is a lieutenant acting on behalf of the narcissist. The next question is from Scarlett Sweetwish. She writes, I do have a question. Stalking. Why do they do it? I know why I have done it in the past because I was curious, but mine keeps hacking my Facebook account and I've changed my password five times. Why do we stalk? simple answer is that it is part of the hoovering. Because we gain fuel in different ways, we may stalk you online so that we provide information, so that we gain information from you. And you may not actually realise that we are stalking you. We find out of the places that you are going to, the places that you are interacting with, the people that you are interacting with, so that we can then decide what is the best time to make a hoover. We may, of course, stalk you in the sense of physically following you, standing outside your home, where you work. Part of this is a form of intimidation for the purposes of causing you to react and therefore give us fuel. It's also part of information gathering and is often done as a preface to making a direct approach to you to try and get further fuel from you or alternatively to draw you back into the formal relationship. Stalking will take many forms. It can be getting people to do it on our behalf, so there is stalking by proxy, whereby our lieutenants follow you around, look at your Facebook information, look at what you're putting on Twitter and report it back to us. We may do it ourselves through social media, through hiring a private detective or inquiry agent to find information out about you. And then there is the actual physical presence where we follow you around or we may even approach you. But stalking is part of hoovering. It is done to gather information and it is done to gather fuel. And it is all done with the purpose of exerting control over you and allowing us to assert our perceived superiority. The next question is from Sunshine, who asks, do you think that you will ever find the perfect fuel? This is what we always hope for. At the start of the seduction of a prospective primary source, this person is regarded as the one, irrespective of what has gone on before. We always search for that perfect, unending, potent provision of positive fuel. We hope and indeed expect you to be the one. This is why we become infatuated with you. This is why we love Bob. This is why we work hard to bind you to us. And each time we believe that you will be the perfect provider of fuel. It then goes wrong. There is devaluation and discard. Before we discard you, we have found the next person. As a consequence, there is the paradox between the fact that, based on past experience, the perfect fuel provider has only been there for a short period of time, sometimes a medium period of time, and then it goes wrong. Nevertheless, notwithstanding past evidence, we still believe that we may well find the one. This is why we keep going and doing as we do. The next question is from 
Amabile. What is the average time frame that your kind is likely to hoover, if it can be predicted? There are, of course, many different types of hoover, and my book Black Hole goes into further detail about this. The actual seduction of you is a form of hoover, but I sense that your question is aimed at the traditional notion of the hoover, which is post-discard or post-escape. In terms of time frame, if you have escaped us, we will roll out what is known as the initial grand hoover. This is a frenzied attempt to get you back under our control and will happen as soon as we realise that you have escaped us. It is quick and therefore will follow hard on the heels of your escape, so long as we are able to find you and know where you are and have a means of contacting you. So accordingly, where you have escaped, the initial grand hoover will happen quickly. If it is a case that you have been discarded, there is no initial Grand Hoover, of course, because we want rid of you. What then happens is there will be follow-up Hoovers, and these can essentially be, be divided into two categories. The first is where you keep contacting us. This might be because you want us back, or you can't understand why you've been discarded, or there is some finished business between us. When you are doing that, we have a new primary source in place. That is why you have been discarded. Therefore, this new primary source is the apple of our eye and the person on which we focus all of our attention. You are a troublemaker. You let us down. You stop providing the fuel to the way that we wanted. Therefore, we paint you black and we have smeared you. Accordingly, if you keep trying to contact us, we are wary of you. Think that you are going to derail our new golden period with our new marvellous primary source. As a consequence of that, we lash out at you. We may politely rebuff you at first. Thereafter, we will lash out and you will be subjected to malign hoovers. We will involve the police to keep you away and may seek a restraining order. And consequently, the speed of those hoovers is very much reliant on how often you are contacting us. You contact us when we are in a new golden period with somebody else, expect a malign hoover to happen straight away. If you do not contact us and you try to stay out of our way, then the follow-up hoovers following post-discard will be of a benign nature. We will be looking to gain positive fuel from you. We may also be looking to draw you back into the formal relationship once again. In those instances, the time frame for the Benign hoovers, of a follow-up nature, following your discard, are very much dependent on when the devaluation starts with the primary source that replaced you. In some instances, where it was only a short golden period, these hoovers could take place a matter of weeks after you were discarded, although that is quite unusual. More likely, it will be months, if not beyond a year, before you start to experience those hoovers. And this is because Meanwhile, we have been focusing on the golden period. We're getting the positive fuel that we want, we have no interest in you, and you are not contacting us. However, once we start to devalue the new primary source, which will happen usually after a number of months, sometimes beyond a year, then that is when we will start to hoover you, so long as there is a hoover trigger, the video spheres of influence in respect to that, and whether the Hoover execution criteria are met. Listen to the video of Hoover time for more information with regards to that. And if there is a Hoover trigger and the Hoover execution criteria are met, we will Hoover you and we will do so in a benign fashion to gain fuel from you and to look at bringing you back into the formal relationship. So, as I have described, it is not a straightforward occurrence, but is reliant on factors such as whether you have escaped, whether you have been discarded, whether you have been trying to contact us, how long the golden period lasts with the new primary source, and when devaluation begins. The next question is from Amanda, who is from Florida in the United States of America. Amanda asks, can you be friends with a high-level narcissist after a breakup and several midnight meetings? I dated him for a year, left him for his friend, cheated on his best friend with him, now I'm married to his ex-friend. Is it possible 
or would it be a hoover? Although we may describe people as our friends, the reality is we regard them as secondary sources of fuel. There are inner circle friends and an outer circle friends, both of which, however, are secondary sources. Accordingly, you may decide that you may want to be friends with somebody, a narcissist that you have broken up with, and when you refer to high level, I assume you mean a greater. All the greater is concerned about is seeing you as a source of fuel, somebody from which character traits can be obtained from, and also in terms of residual benefits. It is all about what we want. So in your instance, the greater narcissist will not just want to be friends in the sense of the way that you understand it. He may decide that he is not interested in an intimate relationship with you, and therefore you would be a non-intimate secondary source. But when he contacts you, yes, it is a hoover, because he is either looking just to gain fuel from you from the interaction, or he is looking to bring you back into his sphere of influence. So when you left, you may well have then become a tertiary source, because you effectively became a stranger. Now, by looking to resurrect what you understand to be friendship, he is looking to make you a non-intimate secondary source, purely in order to service his demands. It may appear like friendship that he wants, but in reality, as always, it is not just, there is no such thing as friendship to a narcissist. It is all about a relationship whereby you supply fuel, character traits and residual benefits.